How good is your favorite NFL team? What's going on, football fans? It's Mitch here once again, back with another NFL Power Rankings video. In this video, I rank every single NFL team from the worst, number 32, to the best in the NFL, entering week six. How good, how bad, or how mid is your favorite team? Gronk spike the like button. Don't forget to subscribe for weekly NFL power rankings just like this, where I give you the brutal truth about your favorite team, their strengths, their weaknesses, and everything in between. Let's get to my opinion on the rankings for all 32 NFL teams. Let's start at number 32 with the worst team in the NFL entering week six. That is none other than once again, my New England Patriots. I was correct. The Patriots are the worst team in the league after they lost to Tyler Snoop Huntley at home. And what makes the Patriots the worst team in the league is the incompetent, incompetent coaching, incompetent offensive line play, a lack of true playmakers on either side of the football. And yes, Drake May will be starting against the Texans. Will that solve the issues? It might help. I'm excited to watch Drake May. I'm actually going to be excited to watch this Patriots team, I've never been less interested in the Patriots. I've never felt less in my heart, in my soul, about my football team than I do currently in the year 2024. I don't feel any sort of buzz with this team. Drake May might provide that for me, so I'm excited. I think he should have been starting in week one because... He had the better training camp. He was the better quarterback all offseason, including the preseason, if you watch the games in the preseason. And it took them a while. And it's probably not the right spot to start a rookie quarterback against arguably the best pass rush in football when you have arguably the worst offensive line, in my opinion, not even arguably. It's probably not the best spot. You should have started him against the Dolphins last week, like I said. And honestly, if Drake May were starting... So far this year, this team would be 3-2, and two, in my opinion. I think they would have beat Seattle, which they lost on basically a blocked field goal at the end of the game. They probably would have beat the Dolphins, and they could have beat the Dolphins anyways if Jalen Polk would have had his heels and bounds, which was a weird rule that I've honestly never seen before. And it probably... Would have been the same against Cincinnati. Like, nothing that Jacoby Brissett has done has been super impressive. The promising thing about Drake May entering the lineup for all Patriots fans is we get to see how talented he is. Because in a situation such as New England where the offensive line stinks, the scheme is pretty basic, and the receivers are not great at all, at least we'll get to see how his arm looks, his mobility. We'll get to see if he has it from an athletic and physical standpoint, and even a mental standpoint. There will be something to build off of, and we'll get a sense of maybe not how good he can be, but if he has the foundation to be the franchise moving forward. So that's what I'm excited about. On top of that, I love Drake May. I think he's going to be fantastic. And I do think there's a chance he does elevate the team. I think there's a chance he makes the defense better because they play with more energy for their young quarterback, understanding he'll be the starter for the foreseeable future. Maybe the offense is more excited to run their route, especially down the field, because they, they might actually have a quarterback that will throw them the ball in a tight window situation. Jacoby was too conservative. Jacoby was too obsessed with not turning it over, too obsessed with getting his really protecting himself, getting the ball out, right? Protecting the offense. Drake May, even if there's more turnovers, even more mistakes, I think there's going to be more plays, which makes the offense better, in my opinion. And I think will improve the entertainment value of the actual team. So I'm looking forward to that. But 
the team is not good. I am definitely skeptical about Gerard Mayo and his in-game decision-making so far. I'm skeptical about him overall as a coach right now. I have not really seen anything that convinced me that he's the guy for the long term. And Alex Van Pelt has been pretty much thrown under the bus. And I wouldn't expect him to have this job next year, to be honest. So we'll see. Everybody's being evaluated right now for the future of the Patriots. But this franchise feels like they don't really have a plan. They don't really know what they're doing. They honestly remind me of the Jets. They honestly remind me of a bad franchise. And that doesn't sound good if you're a Patriots fan. So at number 32... I'm excited about May, but I'm not excited about a lot of other things about this football team. At number 31, the Carolina Panthers. The Panthers are dreadful. They stink. Their defense is awful. They got absolutely shredded by Caleb Williams, who has looked pretty pedestrian and honestly not very good all season. DJ Moore had his revenge game. I'm shocked. Absolutely shocked that happened. The offense came back down to earth against a competent defense in Chicago after facing some pretty basic average defenses, if not bad defenses in Cincinnati and the Raiders. And But Andy Dalton at least gives them some competency offensively. I do think the offensive line is dwindling with the injuries that they really are seeing. I think Austin Corbett got injured at center. Damian Lewis was lost at left guard. So the offensive line is dwindling. Xavier Leggett seems promising in spots. Deontay Johnson has been solid, but you do wonder if he'll be traded. The defense is awful, though. I mean, they have no pass rush, and their corners are left out there to dry. I mean, they are absolutely getting burnt like toast. So, they lost their linebackers. I mean, the Panthers are really, really, really bad. Honestly, I don't know who would win between the Patriots and the Panthers. I think the Patriots are probably more talented, but... The Panthers' offense has just been better. So that's why I ranked the Panthers at number 31. But we'll see how Drake May maybe changes it. The Panthers are really bad. At number 30, the Miami Dolphins, who honestly should have lost to the Patriots. And Miami was the better team, in my opinion. Like, they had a field goal blocked. They may or may not have missed another field goal. I know New England missed a field goal. I can't even really recall what took place in that absolute bogus football game that I watched but I thought that they committed to the run in the second half and I thought that allowed them to win meanwhile New England they were running the ball at will I think it was like the best yards per carry the Patriots have ever had in a loss or something like that but they didn't run the ball the Dolphins run the ball and the Dolphins win and it was nice to see Wright had a successful game Raheem Mosert was back Odell played although he didn't really do anything Tyreek and Waddle and the offense overall seemed kind of more intact. It seemed simplified, but it seemed better. They didn't make as many mistakes. They didn't have as many negative plays, as many sacks. They didn't have some of the big game-losing plays. And I think you've got to give Mike McDaniel credit for that. I think defensively, Miami has been all year pretty decent against the pass, despite them losing some pass rushers up front. Their corner position kind of being beat up at times and also a little underwhelming from the Jalen Ramsey point of view. But Fuller was back against the Patriots and that helped. I would say that the Dolphins' defense is pretty average. Their offense definitely was better. Maybe it was as simple as having Teron Armstead back. I'm not exactly sure. Or Huntley maybe having more time in the offense. There's probably a bunch of different reasons. But the Dolphins actually didn't look awful. I think a lot of people are probably... You know, when you look at their roster, they're still more talented than New England overall. So if they can get Tua back, they're not too far removed from the lead in this division, and they're not too far removed from the wild card spot. They're not going to go anywhere with their current backup situation, but if Tua can get back in there and they can start to dial in on offense and their offensive line can get healthier, I do think there's upside to this team that doesn't exist with a team like New England or Carolina. But at the same time, when they have Huntley in there, they had the injuries that they do on defense and at times on offense. They just seem to have a lot of injuries all the time. That makes them very inconsistent week to week and unreliable. And at least Mike McDaniel kind of figured it out this week. We'll see if that continues or if that was simply a product of playing the Patriots. At the same time, though, if Jalen Polk has his feet in, they lose that game. So you can say what you will, but 
Miami is still not ranking very high. At number 29, the Cleveland Browns are atrocious. The Cleveland Browns are a disaster. The Cleveland Browns, I mean, wow, they are bad. Like, the offense is so incompetent. It's not even funny. This is probably the most incompetent offense in football. Deshaun Watson has more lawsuits settled than passing touchdowns since he came to the Browns. That's embarrassing. The offensive line is not good. Deshaun Watson is sacked like every third play. The run game is super inconsistent. Amari Cooper sometimes catches the ball and he could be traded. David Njoku can't stay on the field. Jerry Judy is just another guy, as Steve Smith would put it. There's nothing about this offense that excites me. And most of all, I want to call out Kevin Stefanski. He's not on the hot seat, I don't believe. Because he's a two-time coach of the year, and I think he is overall a good coach. And if you gave him a competent quarterback, even Jameis Winston, I think it would look better. Or, hey, maybe Joe Flacco, who the franchise didn't want to re-sign because he would probably play too big of a role in getting Deshaun Watson off the field. And the fan base and the players and the locker room would not be able to buy in to Deshaun Watson if Joe Flacco were behind him. But honestly, does it matter who's behind Deshaun Watson? I think a third grader could be a better quarterback than Deshaun Watson. The guy stinks. He's terrible. Don't tell me any different. He's bad, horrible, garbage, trash, hot, flaming garbage. Okay. The defense is not bad. It's not great. It's not what it was, but they play a style that is very volatile, very, very volatile. And when you play a lot of man coverage, you're going to get burnt. You're going to get beat, and we saw that with Jaden Daniels. We also saw them run the ball on Cleveland a little bit better than other teams and even some long screen plays. I felt like the Browns, though, overall did play Daniels as well as anybody has played him all year, if not the best of anybody. It was just that the offense continuously was giving the ball back to Washington giving them great situations, giving them easy positions to score, and just pretty much making it so that it was impossible for the Browns' defense not to give up. And at this point, it feels like the entire roster in Cleveland has given up because who wants to play for Deshaun Watson? He is a bum. He sucks. He's ruining this franchise. And Kevin Stefanski, be a man. Be a man. Why are you being such a baby? Wake up. I understand you're trying to play to the owner and you want to keep your job. But sometimes you're going to get hired somewhere else. And at this point, wouldn't you rather go somewhere else, bro? Like if it were me, I'd stick my neck out for the players because I think that garners more respect at the end of the day. Instead of you keeping your job in a horrible franchise with horrible ownership, with a horrible piece of crap quarterback. Like, Stefanski, you're a two-time coach of the year. Somebody's going to hire you. The Jets would hire you tomorrow. Just, like, do what's best for the team and for the players on the team instead of, like, playing to the owner. I, I am sick of Stefanski. I'm sick of Watson. I don't want to watch this team play. At number 28... The Raiders are really bad. They are really bad. And honestly, they could have won that game against Denver. And I know you're probably saying, Mitch, what are you talking about? They got annihilated on the scoreboard. But bro, just imagine if Gardner Minshew doesn't throw one of the worst interceptions for a touchdown, like Will Levis level bad that we've seen all year. The score is probably 17-3 Raiders. And they probably win that game, honestly. But now they're probably switching quarterbacks. Antonio Pierce is on the hot seat because the guy is just over his skis. I mean, he is so far over his head. He has no idea what he's doing. He's punting the ball on the plus 40 yard line every game. Like he's just giving away possessions, giving away points. Like he is totally incompetent as the head coach of the Raiders and his thing was supposed to be being the player coach, but Max Crosby is speaking out critically in terms of the culture and the team. Devontae Adams wants to get traded. 
Like, there is no good vibes currently with the Raiders, and it's not like Pierce is some sort of magician or wizard when it comes to schematics. He doesn't do anything. He's supposed to be there for culture. He's supposed to be what McDaniels was not, and he's exactly the same thing. In terms of the way this team is treating him and the way this team is performing and the way this team is acting, they're acting like a team that, like the Browns, bro. Like, honestly, like... <sighs> Minshew O'Connell, it's not going to save you. It does not matter. The O-line is not very good right now. They can't run the ball very well. Their defense is underwhelming. There's nothing about this team that excites me other than Brock Bowers. The Raiders are trash. Garbage. At number 27, the Tennessee Titans didn't play this week, so it, it puts a little glimmer on them. Plus, they won the last game they played in an impressive fashion in Miami on Monday night. But honestly, like, who are they playing at quarterback? I honestly have no idea. Is it Will Levis? Is it Mason Rudolph? Will Levis, I think, is the starter as long as he's healthy. But is he fully healthy? Is he ready to go? I like what I saw from Spears and Pollard in the last game. I think D-Hop looks healthier now. Calvin Ridley still, I, we can't find him. Put him on the milk carton. The defense is really good, and I give them credit for that. I, I think Legereus Sneed has been a great addition, same as Ernest Jones, and they pretty much hit those additions out of the park. Who would have thought those players were really great? Not the bottom line view. I mean, I may, maybe told you a few times. But the Titans, I just think, are more competent than the other teams because they feel like they have a little bit more passion, a little bit more direction. Uh, at least one of their units is playing at a pretty high level. And they do have talent on the offense. It's just feels very kind of disorganized and led by a quarterback that you never know what's going to happen. I mean, he is so erratic, it's not even funny. So if Will Levis can like just stop turning the ball over in the worst ways imaginable, this team would actually be fairly competitive at number 27. At number 26, the Jacksonville Jags got their first victory over the Colts, and I could honestly put this team higher. I think Jacksonville is that team that everybody was ranking low on the power rankings that don't deserve to be ranked that low. Just because when you look at the competition, you look at the games they've played, like, yes, they lost to Cleveland. Cleveland is absolute butt cheeks. But, you know, they beat the Colts, okay, with Joe Flacco, who's the better quarterback than Anthony Richardson. They lost to Buffalo in Buffalo. They lost to Miami with Tua in Miami. And what was the other game they lost? I can't recall, but you understand what I'm saying? Like Jacksonville can actually score points at times. They did against the Colts. They threw the ball well. Brian Thomas looks good. Christian Kirk looks good. Their running back combo is really awesome. The O-line is bad, but it's not like New England bad. You know what I mean? It's not like Miami with Ar without Armstead bad. It's not Tennessee Titan bad. It's just bad, you know? Doug Peterson's on the hot seat, but Doug Peterson is certainly a better coach than many of these coaches I've already discussed, like Antonio Pierce. The defense is pretty awful. I'm not going to lie. Like, Jacksonville has, like, a bottom three defense in the league. They can't stop the pass. Like, it is utterly ridiculous. They can't stop the pass. Uh, Nielsen is getting shredded. His defense is getting shredded. They play too much man coverage right now. They, these guys can't. They're not up for the task. They can't do it, man. They can't do it. They can't play with them. They can't win with them. They can't do it, bro. And the pass rush has been underwhelming. The run defense have been up and down. Like, the, the defense is a bit banged up. I do think, though, at least with Jacksonville, they have a little bit more competency at head coach, a little bit more competency at quarterback. Their offense actually has skill talent. Like, you can't say that about a lot of these teams I've already talked about. So, at number 26, Jacksonville, who I think will get closer to 500 in the coming weeks. At number 25, the Indianapolis Colts. The only reason I have the Colts ahead of the Jags, the Colts always lose to Jacksonville and Jacksonville. It's almost like a guaranteed scheduled loss. Like they've lost to them like every single year dating back to I don't even know how long. And also the Colts with Joe Flacco are a little bit more like, I think, entertaining. And I think like they can score. I mean, they've got a good O-line, a good offensive coordinator, a good set of receivers, a really good running back. They didn't have Jonathan Taylor. They were heavily beat up in the game against Jacksonville, and they still almost won the game. So I give them credit for that on top of the wins that they already have over Jacksonville in terms of I think they have two wins now, the Colts, and you know the Jacksonville Jags only have one. So I think that's kind of the difference for me. They're pretty similar teams in terms of very flawed secondaries, very flawed defenses, but their offenses can go out there, and at times they can perform. 
I do think the Colts, like I've said many times, are better with Joe Flacco because Richardson can't complete 50% of his passes. He is the most inaccurate, most incompetent passer of the football at the starting position in the NFL. The offensive line, when Jonathan Taylor's in there, they can dictate a game. They can run the ball. Shane Steichen does call a good game and typically gives them the advantage in that department. Uh, Michael Pittman has been a little bit quiet, but Josh Downs has looked really, really good. Alec Pierce has like 28.3 yards per catch, which is leading the NFL, which is outrageous. And their pass rush at times when healthier can be pretty decent, but honestly, that's like their only saving grace on defense. If they had a competent defense and maybe even their healthy version of this defense, they might be like a team that could be interesting with Flacco, but honestly, I don't I don't see it with the current state of the defense. They're just going to allow 30 points a game, and it's not really going to work out for them. So at number 25, the Colts. At number 24, the Los Angeles Rams, who they have Stafford, they have McVay, right? Like I say this every week, and they're still hoping to get Cup and Nakua back sometime soon. But honestly, this team just... They hang around in every game, and they're very respectable, but I don't necessarily think they're very good. Their defense can easily be ripped apart on the ground or through the air through explosives. They have a good pass rush, I would say, but their secondary is pretty below average. Their run defense is easily ran on, and that allows the other team to dictate the game. At the same time, the receiving core right now is very untalented, I mean, winning Whittington is like re- leading their team in receiving. Tutu Atwell is like their deep threat. I mean, Kobe Parkinson is another option. Like, they just don't have a lot of good receiving threats right now without Cup and Nakua. Kyron Williams is playing pretty good. He played good again against the Packers. He had, like, I think over 100 yards, if I'm not mistaken. And Corum actually saw a little bit of time against the Packers. Stafford is making, I think, one or two critical mistakes at the wrong time, but otherwise is playing pretty well. I mean, he's probably the best overall drop back passer in the NFL right now. It, you know, so they have that going, but I think for the, at least their division is not playing that well. Like the Seahawks only have three wins and they're in first and the Niners and Seahawks play on Thursday. So if the Niners win, then the, the top team in the division is three and three. So that actually still opens the door for the Rams considering they beat the Niners, but they're one and four right now. And that's not very good. That's not a good situation to be in. And it feels like they're constantly chasing the game and they're lacking the control because their defense just isn't very good. So at number 24, I have the Rams. I, I still believe in them to a certain degree because if they can get healthy at receiver, I think they have a very good offense that can completely flip this team around. But I think they might just be too far gone at this point. At number 23, the Arizona Cardinals, who won a genuinely pretty fluky game against the Niners. I mean, they really didn't do anything on offense in the first, like, three quarters of the game. Kyler Murray had a long touchdown. They ran the ball well in the fourth quarter, which enabled them to have a game-winning drive. They were lucky and fortunate that the Niners had a couple tipped interceptions. Mason fumbles the ball in the red zone, and uh, they lost their kicker, San Francisco, which allowed them to you know, basically win the game, Arizona. But you got to give them credit for sticking in there, for coming back, for fighting. And that's the thing I'll always say about Arizona. This team does not give up. I think Gannon still has the hold in terms of getting this team motivated and ready to rock. I think their defense still lacks a ton of talent in the pass rush. Purdy had all day to throw. Their run defense actually was surprising against the Niners. I thought their run defense was pretty stout uh, overall. They didn't allow a lot of big chunk gains they were overall pretty pretty stout on first and second down, which I think gave Brock Purdy and the Niners a bit of issues, especially in the red zone. You know, they held the Niners one to six in the red zone, which is very impressive in terms of coaching and in terms of the ability to stop the run. I would also say Kyler does have that explosive ability that we've seen, but he needs to be more consistent. Marvin Harrison has been a little bit disappointing at times this year. Trey McBride came back from injury. That seemed to help. Michael Wilson has been a very nice surprise. I like how he plays in terms of contested catch scenarios. I think he's good in the slot, especially. And James Conner continues to be, you know, one of the best stories at running back in terms of the way he's playing at his age, the power, the contact balance, the ability to get key and clutch yards week after week. Their offensive line, though, is starting to dwindle and get injured. I think Will Hernandez left the game last week, and I don't think he's coming back for a while. So the Cardinals definitely struggling with the offensive line injuries. Right tackle Jonah Williams, Will, An- Will Hernandez, I should say. 
two guys that were probably like top three on their offensive line entering the year. So yeah, it's not a good sign. I don't think the Cardinals are very talented, but at least they have like a pretty interesting offense, a good running game and a defense that I think it always flies around to the football and they do have their moments. So at number 23, the Cardinals at number 22, the New York Giants, who I think actually are playing a lot better football than many people are giving them credit for. And I was genuinely shocked they dominated Seattle because that is absolutely what I said. They dominated Seattle. Like at halftime, they were whooping their candy asses up and down the football field. Seattle barely had any yards and the Giants were going up and down the field. And if not for a fumble, I think this would have been a blowout, right? A fumble for six by Rayshon Jenkins, who returned it for a touchdown. If not for that, I mean, the Giants utterly dominated. Their play action gave Seattle a lot of issues. Tyrone Tracy Jr. stepped up for Devin Singletary and looked explosive and special at running back. And they ran the ball really well in this game, did New York. Daniel Jones looked the best he's looked since 2022. He was running the ball fiercely and ferociously. He was putting the ball where he needed to. And he was very effective off play action. He rarely ever had to drop back pass. It's a bad formula. We'll talk about Seattle if you know they're going to beat the Niners because the Giants pretty much did exactly what San Francisco would do to them. But we've seen kind of pretty much the formula against Seattle Uh, which I'll talk about with the Seahawks, but the Giants seem to have their formula, which is stay balanced, run the football. I think their pass protection is the best it's been under Brian Dayball so far this year. I mean, they've been much, much better. I think Daniel Jones is growing confidence because of that. And the fact that they won a game in Seattle going cross country without Malik Neighbors, arguably their best player right now, is extremely, extremely, extremely impressive. Their defense just was all over Geno Smith, all game. Like, Geno had nowhere to go. Geno was pressured constantly. And that's what happens, you know, that quarterback play from Geno is going to be a little bit erratic because if he's pressured all the time in every game, that's what's going to happen. We saw the Giants apply that pressure. Dexter Lawrence was relentless in that game. So at number 22, the G-men actually look closer to 2022 than 2023. At number 21, the Denver Broncos. The Broncos are pretty much like the Giants of the AFC. They're not very talented, but I figure they're well-coached. They've got deceptively good offensive line play. They've got enough from the running game. They've got a manufactured quarterback, but their defense, I think, in Denver is a better version uh, of the... I wouldn't say a better version of the Giants, but they're better than the Giants, but I think their offense is worse than the Giants. That's that's kind of the way I would put it. Uh, Denver continues to play well and continue to play competitive football. They... We're losing and trailing early against the Raiders, but they were able to make a big key defensive play and that sparked their team and their comeback in which they dominated the rest of the game. I thought that Sean Payton did a good job of managing Bo Nix in this game. They hit a couple big screen plays and, you know, Nix was able to hit a couple big passes down the field. This was his best statistical day of his career so far. The O-line is actually deceptively a top five unit right now in terms of overall you know, blocking and things like that, run and pass game. And then the pass rush is probably the most underrated in football. They've got a a rotation of athletic edge rushers. They can mix and match up there. I think Vance Joseph on a weekly basis is out scheming the opposing offensive line and pressure situations. And Pat Sertan has been awesome. Riley Moss has been really, really good. Their secondary is low key playing on fire. The Broncos defense is legitimate and If they had like a more established quarterback, if they had like one more receiver that I could rely on, I feel like Denver would be a legitimate playoff team. Right now, I think they're a surprising team. Do you look at the competition face? They haven't really faced many good teams. Uh, The Jets are kind of mediocre. They were able to knock them off in a kind of a fluky fashion. They beat the Bucs convincingly, which was by far their best win. And they beat the Raiders and then they dropped their other two games. But you look at what they've had to go through. I mean, rookie quarterback in Seattle in week one, like they haven't exactly had an easy time, but I I would say that Denver feels like a team that's well coached on both sides that has a good line of scrimmage play. And that's kind of been carrying them so far in this first month or so of the season at number 20, the Chicago bears bears had probably their most promising result of the season in week five as they shellacked the Carolina Panthers, as we've seen a couple teams do already this year. But this one was different because at least it was against Andy Dalton. Now, the Bears do have an elite defense, and that that definitely stifled Dalton 
Uh, their pass rush continues to get after it, and their secondary is one of the best in football. I would say that their offense showed the most signs of life in terms of Caleb Williams' play. His deep ball looked improved. They, they were more explosive in the pass and the running game. And Caleb just seemed more confident, composed, and had more answers to the test this week than previous weeks. If this is the Chicago team we're going to continue to see, I think this is the team that is closer to what we thought they would be before the year. Caleb has been disappointing so far this year until this game. So we'll see if the Bears can continue this. DeAndre Swift, Roshan Johnson, the backfield combo is interesting. Swift continues to be up and down and a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, DJ Moore, nice to see have him have a big game after kind of struggling early this year. They do have a bunch of weapons. If their O-line play can play decent and Caleb can play mistake-free a little bit more, I, I will say they're really trusting him to make a lot of plays. They're really trusting him to carry the offense, which is very rare for a quarterback. So at number 20, the Chicago Bears. At number 19, the Los Angeles Chargers. They were on a bye, so there's not a lot to say here. But the Chargers have a pretty underrated defense right now, a deceptively solid defense. They've been solid against the run. They've been decent against the pass. Their offense led by a banged up Justin Herbert. It's a huge game coming out of the bye against the Broncos that very well could determine which team is a wild card contender from the AFC West and which team is kind of a fraud. I think that's what this game is going to determine. Chargers, I think, are favored on the road in Denver. They do have the superior quarterback. They do have a good coach. They do feel like they have a solid defense. Can Ladd McConkey continue to play well? Can J.K. Dobbins continue to play well? I think the ultimate questions moving forward for the Chargers is offense-based. It is playmaker-based. And they need to just find a way to score more points more consistently. At number 19. At number 18, the New Orleans Saints. The Saints had a very disappointing Monday night football appearance against the Kansas City Chiefs in Kansas City. It's not crazy that the Chiefs beat them, but I think a lot of people were actually predicting a close game and probably an upset for some. But the Saints just didn't look the part in this game. Derek Carr was far too downfield passing reliant, and it, it spelled a game that just they never had control of. The Chiefs controlled the football. The Chiefs were able to slice and dice the zone coverage of the Saints. For whatever reason, they came out with a very strange game plan to throw the ball down the field relentlessly and then defensively play a lot of zone and a lot of, you know, kind of weird rush plan where they weren't super aggressive or trying to get to Mahomes. They were trying to contain him. It was just a very strange script, a very strange game from the Saints in terms of uh, offensive and defensive coaching. I was impressed with Rashid Shahid once again. He continues to be one of my favorite underrated receivers. Alvin Kamara continues to have a bit of a resurgent season. Despite not having great numbers, he still looks fantastic. Carr is now injured, which is not good news. Dennis Allen's on the hot seat. If this team doesn't find a way to string some wins together after a hot start of this season, I think it might have just been phony and fake. Uh, it, it just felt like a team that they, they're too reliant on offense and explosives. Their offensive line is injured and that's not helping. And their defense, I don't really know why they were so passive in that game against the, the Chiefs. It was not like the typical Saints defense that we see. So at number 18, the Saints, very disappointed. At number 17, the Seattle Seahawks. Seahawks also extremely disappointing against the Giants. They got their butts kicked. They got dominated. They got bullied. They got ran on. They got thrown on. I mean, Darius Slayton had a day. Trey Brown couldn't cover him to save his life. And I think they're going to have a lot of issues with the Niners offense if that's the way they play uh, once again. I mean, the front should be improved. They should be healthier, you would think. But it didn't really seem to matter. They couldn't really get a lot of pressure on Daniel Jones, and they couldn't really stop the run. Offensively, the Seahawks couldn't block a soul against the Giants. That's a big issue. They're going to have to find a way to run the ball moving forward to keep that pressure off of Geno Smith to keep the like the script off balance, keep the defense off balance. Because if teams know they're passing and drop back a lot, which is what Geno did against the Giants, it's easy to rush the quarterback. 
if they're not running a lot of play action, if they're not running a lot of motion to set up the run and the pass game, tie it together, it's going to be too predictable and it's going to get Geno hurt. It's going to get Geno hit. And again, I don't like the matchup against the Niners because of those reasons I saw against the Giants. I think it's going to be a tough day for them. But the game is for the division lead. Mike McDonald has had some success against the Niners. They have built their team purposely to try to beat the Niners. We'll see if that comes in handy. Um, I was just very unimpressed with the Giants game. The only reason it was close is because of a fumble at the goal line in which Jenkins was able to return it for a touchdown. And, you know, the Giants were able to block their field goal. Like, there's just a lot wrong with that game for Seattle. At number 16, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the most mid-average team in the NFL. Justin Fields continues to look like Justin Fields. He's blind. He can't see most of the field. Uh, he is a good athlete, but it feels like they're not running him enough in the offense. The O-line is not allowing them to run the ball if, uh, extremely effectively or efficiently, and Najee Harris has given them next to nothing. Their wide receiving core is pretty much George Pickens or Bust. Pat Fryermuth every once in a while shows up, but they're throwing the ball religiously to Van Jefferson, which is not great. And defensively, the Steelers are really good, but they were very underwhelming against a Dallas team that... Yeah, they have Dak and CeeDee Lamb, but I mean, there's not a lot of skill talent there outside of CeeDee Lamb and maybe Jake Ferguson, and they can't run the ball very well. They actually allowed the Cowboys to run the ball better than you would have thought against the Steelers, and the Steelers' pass rush in the biggest moments kind of underwhelmed, and they didn't come through against Dak. So if Dak's out clutching you in your home building, you've got a problem. So Pittsburgh... They're, for the first time this year, their defense did not perform the level of expectation, and they lost. At number 15, the Cincinnati Bengals. Yes, people are going to say the Bengals are too high. I don't care. The Bengals are a good football team, at least in terms of their offense. Their offense might be legitimately the best offense in the league right now outside of maybe Washington. Um, Joe Burrow is currently the number one rated quarterback in EPA. Joe Burrow has the most passing touchdowns in football. Jamar Chase is up there for receiving yards. I think he's second. T. Higgins had multiple touchdowns against the Ravens. And they absolutely sliced and diced the Ravens after the Ravens completely shut down the Bills in the previous matchup. The Bengals have been moving the ball at will in recent weeks. Their last three games since getting back T. Higgins has been off the charts good offensively. So if they continue to score points, I believe they're going to be able to turn this thing around because their defense may not be good. Their defense may not be, you know, uh, it might not even be average. But what's the chances they play this bad for the rest of the year? I'm not exactly sure. Plus they played, you know, Lamar Jackson, they played the awesome Washington offense the way they're playing recently. They played Carolina, kind of not a lot of film on Andy Dalton. Um, and that was sort of garbage time-ish as well. And then, you know, you look at the games they've played. I mean, they've played the Chiefs and lost the Chiefs. They played the Ravens. They lost the Ravens. They played the Commanders, who are 4-1. and one. They lost the Commanders. So you really look at the competition faced. It's been pretty stiff. If a couple plays go their way in each of those games, they win. They should have beat the Ravens. They should have beat the Ravens, 100%. I blame Zach Taylor for running the ball three times in overtime consecutively. If they don't do that, they win the game, and how are we talking about them now? They're probably closer to the top 10. On top of that, they probably put, should have beat the Chiefs, right? Stupid pass interference call. Also, you know, you, you got that fumble from Burrow that was kind of unfortunate, goes for a touchdown. They shut down Mahomes in that game, and then... Uh, the other loss against Washington, it was a it was a duel. It was a shootout. If a couple of plays go their way, they might win. So, like, New England was week one. I know they lost in New England. It was week one. They fumbled twice, like, in the red zone. So that also happened. They've been very unfortunate, very unlucky. Their offense has been phenomenal, though. And that's why I still rank them in the top half of the league. Because I still believe, based on, they're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ravens. They're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Chiefs. They're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with some good football teams. And despite losing, I still believe that they're going to be able to string some things together. Their next few games are going to determine their season. They don't play an overly difficult schedule. It all begins on primetime in New York against the Giants. At number 14, the New York Jets. And I know people are going to go crazy. And th these two teams are interchangeable, the Jets and the Bengals. But I actually felt like the Jets played their best game of the season against the Vikings in London. I thought their defense played the best game I've seen them play all year. They were constantly frustrating Sam Darnold, not allowing open throws, you know, tight contested passes, 
Uh, they were getting pressure on Sam Darnold. They were slowing down their running game. And the Jets' defense finally looked like the Jets' defense in that game. On top of that, Rodgers has had promising moments as a drop-back passer. He threw three interceptions. That's awful. But honestly, like, I think Rodgers is playing a little bit better than people are saying in terms of, I don't think he looks washed. I think he's throwing an accurate ball. I think he's made some plays out of the pocket. I think he's doing a good job at the line of scrimmage. I honestly think Rodgers is performing better than the narrative is, is saying he is. Um, and the defense seems to have turned the corner to a certain degree against a competent Vikings, good Vikings offense unt up until that point. They pretty much shut them down in the second half. So I thought the Jets could have won that game against Minnesota, a team that will be in my top three in this video. So I actually was impressed with the Jets. I'm, I'm genuinely surprised that Robert Sala got fired after that game. It is surprising. I think Robert Sala is not much of a loss. I don't think Robert Sala is a particularly good football coach, uh, especially when it comes to being a head coach. All he really does is run up and down the steps. And if that was a distraction or if Rodgers and him didn't see eye to eye or whatever was the case, I don't necessarily think this is going to kill the vibe for this team. I think it could only really boost this team up. Um, I would also say that the defense, you know, Sala deserves respect and, and credit for that. But, you know, they still have their defensive coordinator there. So we'll see how that goes. Um, Hackett is kind of a joke in my opinion, but Rodgers seems to love him. Brees Hall has continued to be disappointing. Garrett Wilson finally had a breakout game. Al Lazard can't catch a cold. Uh, Allen is a beast. The O-line, I think, is underrated. I, I know that the pressure stats and things say otherwise, but I actually think the O-line's been pretty good. I don't know. Maybe it's just my eyes are wrong, or I don't know what it is. Maybe it's Rodgers is throwing the ball really fast. I can't exactly figure it out. But whenever I watch them, I don't think they're getting overwhelmed up front. And then defensively, again, I, I think their D-line has improved their play throughout the weeks. So at number 14, the Jets. At number 13, the Dallas Cowboys. Cowboys with an impressive win in Pittsburgh on Sunday Night Football. Not an easy thing to do, despite the Steelers having injuries on the O-line, having Justin Fields at quarterback, a lack of receivers. There's a lot of questions about the Steelers. But the Cowboys were very beat up. I mean... No Micah Parsons, no Demarcus Lawrence, their defense, their defensive line, very undermanned. They still really played hard and they played really well and honestly maybe played their best defensive game in the entire season. And that's crazy to say. The offense, I feel like in Dallas, I, I like how Dak's playing. I honestly think Dak is a refreshing quarterback to watch in the modern NFL because he plays a lot more like the 2000s or 2010s-esque quarterback. He plays a lot more like a Matt Ryan than he does a... Uh, a Caleb Williams or a, you know, even like Pat Mahomes style of play. He He's a lot more drop back passer. CD is still a stud. Ferguson is low key, like a top 10, top eight tight end in the league. I think Rico Dowdle continues to look more confident as a runner and he provided a spark on the ground for them. Jalen Tolbert had his best game of his NFL career, which was nice to see. The O-line held up pretty well against a really good pass rush in Pittsburgh on Sunday night. They were able to uh, persevere at the end. They were able to make plays at the end. That's something that Dallas hasn't always been able to do in this Mike McCarthy era. And they were able to do that through like a delay and a weather storm and all that stuff. So yeah, it was not a game that Dallas typically wins. I was actually impressed with that. At number 12, the Philadelphia Eagles, who I think could be back in the top 10 soon. It depends on A.J. Brown's health, Devontae Smith's health. I do think the defense is going to continue to get a little bit better under Vic Fangio. The secondary does scare me. The overall speed of the middle of the field for this defense does scare me. And the pass rush is very inconsistent. But they do have some studs out there like Jalen Carter. Can they... Uh, get, you know, can they get Huff going a little bit more? Can they get more out of their edge rushers like Sweat? That's going to be a, dif a difference maker for them. But I'm very intrigued to see how their defense looks off of a bye week with that time to fix things, prepare, and get a little bit better. Offensively, I think they are one of the best offenses in the league when they're fully healthy. Their O-line is powerful and is actually leading the NFL in Yards before contact, Saquon has been one of the best running backs on top of that in football. Dallas Goddard has been one of the best tight ends in football. Jalen Hurts has been mistake prone, but also he's been making plays. Um, I would say that they need to get healthy. I think their team is totally drastically different without A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. They're going to have to win shootouts probably a lot of the time. But again, I think Fangio will improve this defense. So the Eagles are interesting, man. I think they have a chance to 
maybe kind of sneak up on the rest of the NFC. A lot of people are putting attention on the commanders in that division now, but the Eagles are still there. Like, don't forget about them. At number 11, the Atlanta Falcons, who had a huge win over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I do have them behind the Bucs in this video. The Bucs were more injured than the Falcons, and I felt like the Bucs kind of blew that game at the end. But you've got to give Kirk Cousins a lot of credit for 500 yards, that comeback, the crazy, just great situational football. Uh, that the Falcons have played all season long on offense. Cousins has really like got, you know, Darnell Mooney, Drake London, their rapport right now is really, really good. Kyle Pitts had a sighting in this game. He, for, he remembered he had hands. The O-line was protecting Cousins really well, and Cous Cousins was throwing piss missiles out there. He was uh, putting the ball in dangerous spots, in tight windows, and connecting. Um, his rhythm was outstanding. I really, really appreciated watching him play quarterback. I thought him and Baker had a duel, an old-fashioned passer, pocket passer duel, and it was just a lot of, lot of fun to watch. Just the placement of the football, the accuracy, knowing where to go on every play, you know, just continuously picking apart zones. There's a lot of quarterbacks right now that can't do that. I just think Cousins is still playing really, really well. I want to see more out of Bijan, man, honestly. I want to continue to see more out of the complementary weapons on offense. If if Kyle Pitts can can get a little bit better with each and every week more involved, it feels like they have one of the best wide receiver combos in football right now with Drake London and Darnell Mooney. They seem to be the perfect blend of quickness, speed, and, and size and power. So really excited for those guys. The defense in Atlanta did get shredded and absolutely annihilated. Uh, so can they bounce back? I'm not sure because their talent is just pretty underwhelming. Um, but the secondary, I think, has played a lot better for the most part during the year. They really struggled to cover Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, and that was a big story in the game. Um, they benefited from some poor management from the play calling on offense of the Bucs, from some penalties at opportune times, and and Todd Bowles, you know, kind of choking that game away. But Atlanta, I really like the state of their offense. They need to kind of figure out their defense right now, but they got a clutch win at home on a short week. At number 10, I've got the Washington Commanders officially moving into my top 10. The Commanders, again, I think their offense right now, there's, there's no denying the, the drives in terms of the success per drive, in terms of the yards per play, in terms of the touchdowns, like... They are scoring points, and whenever you can score points at this rate, you are a good team, and you're a tough team to beat because a lot of teams can't keep up with you. Jaden Daniels did come back down to earth a tad bit against the Browns, but luckily for Washington, they played Deshaun Watson, which allowed them to kind of mask anything that Daniels was struggling with because they got so many opportunities at the well in order to get in the end zone and to score a ton of points. And it still allowed them to continue their momentum of ridiculous scoring. Uh, Brian Robinson looks like one of the best running backs in the league right now. Austin Eckler looks rejuvenated. Zach Ertz is contributing. I love what I'm seeing out of Luke McCaffrey in terms of yards after catch. Terry McLaurin is elated he has a quarterback to throw him the ball down the field right now. Uh, Diami Brown looks impressive as a speedster on the outside. The O-line is playing great. Cliff Kingsbury's dialed in. And again, even with the low kind of completion percentage and percentage of like the offense being uh, as kind of efficient down to down, they were able to create explosives, which offset the lack of, uh, you know, the lack of consistency per play, if that makes sense defensively they've played really well the last two weeks now they did play Deshaun Watson which I think the BC Lions could get to Deshaun Watson but I, I would also say that the you know they've played better they played well against the Cardinals um so that's that's good I, I don't think the defense is particularly good because I don't think the edge rush is particularly good I think the corners suck but I will say that the linebackers are really good especially Frankie Luvu the D tackles are really good and the safeties are competent. So I think this, the commanders are a top 10 team for me right now. They're, they're four and one. They, they were never considered in this range before the year and they shouldn't have been based on their previous track record, a new rookie uh, quarterback and new head coach. They shouldn't have been considered here, but they're proving us wrong. They're continuing to play good football. Uh, I don't think the defense is going to give them a super high ceiling because I just don't think it's very good. But I think right now they're a playoff team and they could be the best team in their division. At 
number nine, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Buccaneers were really injured against the Falcons, and they were losing players left and right in that game on Thursday night, which really hurt their defense. I think what we saw in that game is that the middle of the field for this Tampa Bay defense was so incompetent. Their nickel corner play, their safety play without Antoine Winfield, their linebacker play losing their nickel linebacker was critical. Uh, their pass rush wasn't very effective, which is a, something I've always been you know, very critical of Tampa Bay this offseason. They need to do more to address the, the pass rush. Um, but they will get Kalijah Kansi back. They will get Antoine Winfield back. So there are answers that will be coming in terms of players. I actually wonder if they're going to pick up Devin White just for an extra linebacker in certain situations because he is familiar with the defense and all that. And he does do certain things really well, like blitz and Todd Bowles' system, but he's he's just very, very incompetent in certain areas. But maybe as an extra guy, they could bring him back in um, to Tampa Bay. Now, I will say that the offense looks awesome. I love the offense. I think they're one of my favorite offenses to watch. You know who's getting the ball. Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, but teams can't stop it. Now, they were missing their third and fourth receivers, and they were still able to put up a huge amount of yards, a huge amount of points, and it didn't really seem to matter. I mean, even Sterling Shepard scored a touchdown in this game. Kate Otten looked decent, uh, but you know Palmer and McMillan were both out. I like the combination of White and Irving. I think it's an improvement at running back than they've had in previous seasons since really 2021 Leonard Fournette. And it's just, it sucks that Irving fumbled. Um, it, it sucks the way they handled the end of the game. They were too conservative. Um, but it is what it is. It happens sometimes. The defense needs to play better. It's a divisional game on the road on a short week. I'm not going to hang it over their heads. The O-line played perhaps their best game of the entire year. Uh, but Baker Mayfield, man, he's an MVP candidate. He might be the MVP of the league right now. He's playing that well. He is playing great quarterback play. At number eight, the Green Bay Packers. The Packers, explosive but inconsistent. That's the way that I would explain this team in terms of offense and defense. Explosive but inconsistent. Xavier McKinney might be the best safety in football right now. First guy that comes to mind. When Jair is back there, it changes their defense completely, in my opinion. Their pass rush... A little bit up and down. Their run defense, a little bit up and down. Their linebacker play, pretty incompetent. But their offense, again, run game, a little disappointing. But G Reed has been unreal. Tucker Craft looks unreal. Uh, Jordan Love can make as good of a throw on a per-play basis as anybody in football. But he can also look like Anthony Richardson at times and throw the ball directly into the dirt with an open man. Uh, Matt LaFleur is a great play caller and a great coach. I think their defensive coordinator, their defense overall, I think is an improvement when they have their pieces in there uh, from last year and the year previous. I just think they need to figure a little bit more out uh, up front, you know, getting to the quarterback and stopping the run. I think they need to be more competent in those areas. I think Love needs to be more consistent throwing the ball. And I think they need to have more gimmies in the offense in terms of easy plays to get drives started. They have too many drives where it's three and out or it's explosive plays and touchdowns. They have two, They have a lot of short drives for points and for touchdowns, but they have a lot of games, I feel like, right now where they're not able to control the game because their offense is way too inconsistent in terms of just picking up first downs and having time of possession. I think they need to get back a little bit to the Aaron Rodgers days of like, okay, we're going to hold the ball. We're going to control the clock. And I think a lot of that comes down to the run game being very inconsistent. So they need to get more out of Josh Jacobs right now. At number seven, the San Francisco 49ers. Yes, I still have them in my top eight. I still have them at number seven. And people are going to say this is crazy, whatever. I don't care. I'm just going to stick with my guns here. The Niners, they once again, just as they did against the Rams, lost a game they should not have lost. And when you look at every metric and every way, shape, or form, they could, they should and could be four and one, and they should be four and one. So given that it's only week five entering week six, I am not going to rank because the Niners are not four and nine, right? They don't have a chance to really rise into the playoff ranks. Let's say they're only two and three. They can beat Seattle. They're back as the NFC West champs right now. That's all that has to happen. I'm going to the game. I'm looking forward to the game. Christian McCaffrey's coming back in the next few weeks. That's going to be a huge bonus to this team. And honestly, I saw a lot of good things in the Arizona game. I thought their run game was actually less than it usually is. But I saw Brandon Ayuk looking like Brandon Ayuk for the first time all year. Their pass blocking was actually very good in this game. I thought that their defense actually played the run really well for about three quarters. 
except for the Kyler Murray run, right? I thought they held uh, Marvin Harrison in check and Trey McBride in check. Their pass coverage all year has actually been pretty good. There's certain things right now, like red zone efficiency is 31st in football. They're turning the ball over, you know, when they have a chance to put the ball, uh, put the game away. They get, they lose their kicker in the third quarter, I think, which doesn't allow them to kick a field goal once they get to the red zone. This team punted once and they lost. It was fluky. Like, again, like people are going to dock them, put them at 17, but at the same time, favor them over Seattle, who they'll put at 14. That's just not how I build my power rankings or my power ratings, right? So to me, like the 49ers are a flawed team. I think they're, they, they kind of feel more like the 2021 team who is more of a wild card, kind of dangerous dark horse team because they've got a lot of talent and a great coach, but it feels like they are more flawed just because they they're playing on the margins right now of like something should regress. Maybe when McCaffrey backs, their red zone offense will improve. It does feel like their receivers are a little bit uh, less dynamic. Like Debo has been a bit up and down. Kittle has been a bit up and down. He's had some unconventional drops that he typically has uh, or doesn't have. Jawan Jennings has a huge game one game, kind of disappears this game. The defense, it feels like the pass rush isn't as good as previous years. But their corners, I think, are better than any season I can really recall. I think their linebacker play, uh, Fred Warner is playing unbelievable. The other guys have been up and down. I think Winters is probably better than Devondre Campbell, honestly. Their safeties, they've had some injuries there, and they've been trying to survive. I think Mustafa has been promising. I think Brown's actually been really good. Like, again, like... This team just right now, their record does not align with how good they're playing. I'm not sure what their DVOA is. I'm not sure what that what that st- says about them. I don't know where they rank. I have to assume they're top 10 because there's two games right now where they easily should have won that they lost. And so um, I'm just banking on regression for this team because I think they're too talented. They're too well coached. They have too good of a track record in order for this to continue. So at number seven, I expect a big performance from this team on Thursday night. At number six, the Buffalo Bills. The Bills are ahead of the Niners, despite I think having more flaws than the Niners, because they've lost to two really good teams, in my opinion, the Ravens and the Texans. And they were both on the road. So Buffalo's always better in Buffalo. There's no doubt. You know, when you have the Buffalo Mafia jumping through tables like Mick Foley in 1998, you're going to be better right? Uh, Josh Allen has not played well the last two weeks, in my opinion. I thought he played fine against the Ravens, but it was more of a defensive issue. I thought this week he was pretty much the worst I've seen him play in a while, but I thought, again, it was a common issue. Their receivers are not good enough right now, and we thought that would be an issue before the year. It didn't look that way in the first three weeks, but without Khalil Shakir, it was very evident. They could not separate. They could not get open, and uh, Allen struggled with the the pass rush of the Texans and in combination of having his receivers absolutely suffocated. So I think this team needs to trade for Devontae Adams. If there is a team that needs to trade for a receiver, it's absolutely the Bills. If they get a receiver, it would completely change their team. It would completely open up their offense. It would completely change their prospect for a Super Bowl. Because if you have Josh Allen with the number one receiver, um, that would be better than Stephon Diggs is currently. Like Adams is better than Stephon Diggs. Even Amari Cooper is better than Stephon Diggs in my opinion. So if you were to bring in somebody like that, I think that would change because it would give them another guy that can actually win against man coverage. And teams right now um, are, you know, just they're 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 playing tight coverage. And eventually, you know, you've also seen kind of a regression in their pass blocking where the last two weeks they've been giving up 40% pressure which is not good. Their run game has been uh, been halted by these last two defenses. And their defense is just very injured. Um, Ed Oliver didn't play last week. They don't have Matt Milano still. Uh, their safeties beat up. Their linebackers have been beat up. So they've been missing a lot of key pieces. So with the combination of receiver play, uh, Allen, the, the offensive line regression, defensive injuries, Plus, they played really good teams. I think they've been sort of exposed to a certain degree. But at the same time, this is a proven team that has still, in my opinion, you know, one of the top players in the league, an MVP in any given week, and you know, a really good running game. I think they showed enough promise in the first three weeks that they can be a good offense. Uh, 
And then the defense, I think when healthy is, is like a borderline top 10 defense. So it's just that they're not healthy. So at number six, I have the Bills. At number five, the Houston Texans. The Texans still did not play their best game and they beat the Buffalo Bills. So that's great. I do think the Texans look like currently the biggest threat to the Chiefs in the AFC. Um, maybe because you don't really trust the Ravens in terms of that matchup. But the Texans, I just think they're that team that they're young, but they feel like they're just going to continue to get better and better and better and better and better as the season goes on. And right now, their defense, like low-key, a lot of people aren't talking about it. They're currently the best pass rush in the NFL with Daniil Hunter and Will Anderson. Uh, their run defense has been pretty solid overall, although more spotty than last year, but I think overall pretty solid. Their corner play uh, was really good against Buffalo, and their overall secondary, I think outside of maybe the Minnesota game, has been mostly good. So the Texans' defense looks really good. And when Nico Collins was on the field against Buffalo, they were torching the Bills. Torching the Bills. Um, who, like I said, are not a bad defense. So... Stroud is an excellent quarterback. He's one of the three to four best quarterbacks in football on in any given week at any given time. Uh, and, you know, the offensive line actually avoided penalties, avoided negative plays. Stephon Diggs looks like he continues to fit in in this offense. And Tank Dell is getting healthier. Joe Mixon will come back, which I think will improve the running game. And they actually ran the ball okay against Buffalo. And Dalton Schultz makes a few catches every game. Like, the Texans... If they just can get better on the O-line and a little bit better in terms of their offensive play calling on early downs, this team can go to the Super Bowl. Again, I've said it many times. At number four, the Detroit Lions. The Detroit Lions, you could argue number three, they were on a bye. It's more of a resume thing in terms of the Lions versus my number three team um, in terms of who they've beaten and who they've lost to. But the Lions, their offense is very good. We know that they can control a game through their running game. Their running backs are good. Jamison Williams has been the breakout story of this team this season. But the thing to me is like, the offense is really, really good. The defense is still not very good. And that to me could be the Achilles heel of this team come playoff time. And I'm trying to project, you know, when they're playing the elite teams, how will this look? I think it's a big test against Dallas. In Dallas, Dak Prescott, CeeDee Lamb. It's going to be a very big test. Now, I actually think that their offense should be able to power them to this victory. We will see, though. Uh, it will not be easy. But I think the Lions are a very, very good team. And it just feels like they can outscore 99% of teams. And if they can just avoid certain matchups, they can really beat a lot of teams. Because I think their run defense is really good. It's more so their secondary, their pass defense is very exposable um, and it's very volatile because they play a lot of man with corners that uh, Carlton Davis at times has played really well, but Arnold has really struggled and uh, the rest of their depth, you know, the rest of their defense at the corner position has been up and down and Davis is usually taking on the best receiver on the other team. So he's going to give up plays. So it's just like, yeah, it, that's just the way I see it. So at number four, the Lions, um, they do to me right now feel like th the team that I would pick to go to the Super Bowl in the NFC, but something in the back of my mind is lurking and telling me that their defense is going to let them down, and that's, ki that's kind of currently what I'm thinking. At number three, I have the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, the Ravens have a better resume than Detroit, like I suggested, which is why they're ahead. I think the Lions are a more complete team overall than the Ravens. I think the Ravens do have uh, more holes. Their pass defense specifically, just as Detroit's, has been awful. And I, you know, the, both teams are very strong against the run, but I think the Lions have a more consistent offense just because I think their O-line is just much better. And I think the O-line of the Ravens can be exposed at times as well as the drop back pass of the Ravens can be exposed. But their run game is probably the best in football right now. Lamar is playing very, very well. Uh, I would say that, again, like I'm not surprised. He's an excellent player. I just think the things that we know that he's struggled with in the past, we haven't necessarily seen yet, right? Like, which is playoff time, drop back passing, coming back in a game, um, having to deal with pass rush all the time and blitzes all the time and receivers separating down the field and getting open and making plays. 
Those are the areas of the Ravens that I'm always concerned about. I'm always concerned about, are they playing with the lead? Now, they did come back against the Bengals in large part because of the Bengals, but also because the defense of the Bengals is tr trash. Um, on top of that, uh, I think that the Ravens, one thing that I love about them is their run defense and their rush offense. And just like Detroit, that's going to win you a lot of football games. And you combine that with an electric play from Zay Flowers. He can beat man coverage against most corners in football. Mark Andrews and Isaiah Likely can sprinkle in a few plays every game. Lamar can run uh, and and create. And so they they have something. They need to figure out their, their pass defense because if they don't, they're in trouble. But I think that at mostly every other area has been good. I would say about the offensive line and pass protection because I've been asked about this. The thing is they have not faced a lot of those situations. They have not faced a lot of situations where they're having to drop back and throw. Um, a lot of their passing has been off of play action. A lot of their passing has been from ahead. A lot of their passing has been in not like because their run game has been so good, which if they can continue, that's great. A lot of their passing has been in like second and medium and and third and one and third and short and first and ten. So it hasn't been a big deal. But we'll see if they if they get exposed eventually. But right now they're doing fine. At number two, the Minnesota Vikings. I moved the Vikings down to two just because they looked a little bit more leaky, a little bit more inconsistent uh, this week than past weeks. They they were not a convincing winner against the against the Jets. The Jets actually, I thought, outplayed them for like two to three quarters. It was just that they the Jets couldn't get out of their own way in terms of mistakes, in terms of drops, in terms of penalties. Um, but the Vikings, they arguably have the best defense in football right now. Their run game has been better than expected. Jefferson is still a beast. And he played one of the worst matchups for him in football this week, and that's why he was a little bit more quiet. Addison is a really good player. Sam Darnold had his worst game, and they still survived. And that's kind of what's worrying me is Sam Darnold long-term. He did get exposed to a certain degree in this game. But I don't think that's going to happen against a majority of defenses because the Jets have a legitimately good pass defense. And their defense will be able to carry them. Shout out to Fawn Gilmore for that key clutch interception at the end, as he always does, uh, one of the best of all time. Flores and O'Connell give this team a chance in every game and every matchup against any coaching staff and any team. At number one, I have the Chiefs, just because I thought they were more impressive this week than they've been all year. And I felt like they kind of were just more impressive than the Vikings. They're both undefeated, so they're pretty much interchangeable. But I lean back to the Chiefs because I thought this was their best game of the year against the Saints. I thought Mahomes played his best. Even though, you know, a lot of the throws were open, he took what was there and he made the most of it. I thought he made some really nice clutch scrambles. I thought that he was mostly very accurate. Juju was actually really impressive in this game, believe it or not. Kelsey looked the best he's looked all year. The O-line was pretty darn good. I thought he Mahomes had great protection in this game. I thought that Kareem Hunt looked legit at running back. Like, honestly, probably better than Pacheco. <laughs> I'm not even lying about that. Uh, you know, they've got other guys like Noah Gray and Worthy can really scare a defense. And that's not a bad Saints defense. And they kind of move the ball at will for most of the game. And then on the other side, they have a very good defense. I don't think it's like dominant. I don't think it's as good as last year, but I think it's darn good. And they're very situationally uh, sound. And McDuffie, the secondary, the corners, they play tight coverage. Chris Jones can wreck a play or two. Uh, in every drive and their linebackers I thought you know Bolton had a really good game I thought against the Saints um, and they did what they had to against Derek Carr you know they they allowed a couple of big plays but overall they they shut down Kamara they blitzed Carr and it was effective so and it's not easy to cover Olave and Shahid every play so at number one the Chiefs are back on top we'll see if this continues I am intrigued to see how their offense develops Juju kind of has taken over that Rasheed Rice role, and we'll see if he can be the same sort of player for them, or uh, it did feel like Kelsey kind of took a bigger role. It did feel like they ran the ball more than usual, but other teams, the Saints, that's kind of their weakness. Other teams, will they be able to do that against? We will find out. But at number one, Kansas City. There are not a lot of good teams in this NFL right now, I would say. 
There are not a lot of really great teams, not a lot of really talented teams. I still think that this thing is wide open in most divisions, in, in both conferences, and we will find out. But it's Mitch. Those are your week six NFL power rankings. I'll see you in the next video. Gronk spike the like button and subscribe. Deuces.